So good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome. I really appreciate you all taking the time out of your day uh, to join us for a really exciting site plan review presentation. Um, so on behalf of Southern Tier West, my name is Jane Nicholson and I'm a senior planning associate uh, with MRB Group. Um, I'm out of the Syracuse office. Um, we're headquartered in Rochester. So I've been working in planning for about 20 years now. Um, I've worked on the private side and the public side. Um, I'm a former planning director, uh, overseeing a codes office uh, and a building department. And for about the past six years, I've been working now um, on the, uh, in consulting. I also serve on my local ZBA, um, which is a lot of fun. I've seen a lot of different projects come through the door. Um, and I, I really, really enjoy working with planning and zoning board members um, and working through their projects. So um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I'm going to do a presentation for about 40 to 45 minutes. I really want to leave uh, ample time for question and answer discussion. I want to hear about your experiences uh, in your communities, what some opportunities are and challenges with regard to the site plan process. Um, and any other ideas that you may have. So this is really meant to be a, a fun presentation and, and I hope you enjoy it. So let's get started. Um, so many of you have probably participated in the New York Department of State site plan trainings before. Um, and these are really great because they focus on the logistics, the procedures, the timelines, uh, what you can do, what you can't do. Um, and this is really wonderful, um, but I wanted to kind of take a little bit of a different approach. Um, and while I do touch on, on, on some of the logistics, I really want to leave this presentation with you all feeling extremely confident in your decision-making abilities, especially when it comes to the site plan process. It's not black and white. There is a lot of gray. And so hopefully this presentation will start to really clarify um, some of the challenges you may have had uh, to date. So just a couple of objectives. Um, number one, um, I want to um, define what the purpose of site plan review is. I'm going to do a brief introduction to the process. Um, and I, if I could ask everyone to mute, if you're not muted already. Um, what's not working for you? Oh, could you please mute? If you aren't, thank you. Um, so I'm sorry, I'd like to uh, define okay. the purpose yeah, of site plan review. Um, introduce the process. Uh, provide an overview of the components of a site plan application, and also want to provide a really uh, good best practices, you know, comprehensive overview of procedures. What are you supposed to be looking for when you're actually reviewing a site plan? So let's get started. Um, number one, why are we even undertaking site plan at all? Um, developers know what they're doing, we trust them, right? I know it doesn't always work out that way. Um, so I like to show rather than state the purpose of site plan review. So these are a couple examples of projects that never should have left the site plan review stage. Uh, this is what happens when development goes wrong um, and a result of failed attempts at utility placement, grading, drainage, we have challenges here of ADA accessibility um, and the overall user experience. Um, common sense just didn't make it into some of these examples. And so this is what we want to avoid. Now let's take a look at what happens when your site plan review process works. When it goes right, it's a win-win for the developer and a win for the community. The result is a strong sense of pride for the community, um, and you can tell in these examples that the community had buy-in. When you have good development, it could really serve as a catalyst for future development. So you set the tone. When you get a project right, you set the tone for all future development that comes into your community. It kind of is a domino effect. 
So our goal through the site plan review process is really ultimately to protect the integrity of the community. Don't sacrifice what's special about your community. You know, it's character, the people that live there, and really start to balance developer interest with a community interest. Again, we want to set a tone for all future development. Now, if you're in a community that's maybe a little bit more distressed, um, that really has some building to do, then it's about creating a standard for your community and improving the situation, not holding it back. If you need good development, you have someone that just comes and throws something in, it, again, it's setting a negative tone. We want to do the opposite. We want to set a really good tone moving forward. So let's start um, to talk a little bit about site plan review. Uh, site plan review really gives the community some control over development impacts um, by working with property owners um, and, uh, and, and helping to shape development in the best manner possible. Um, site plan review allows the municipality to place certain conditions on a development um, and is really there to promote um, development that's going to be beneficial uh, to the community or potential adverse impacts. Um, so let's um, start to look at really what is a, a site plan, especially for you members, uh, planning and zoning board members uh, that are newer. I know there's a lot to digest um, and you probably have a lot of questions. So some of this seems maybe more obvious, um, but again, I wanna make sure that you're getting that groundwork um, for when you start to go in, into the reviews. So just a little bit of New York State law here. Um, a site plan is a rendering, drawing, or sketch prepared to certain specifications and contains necessary elements as set forth in applicable zoning ordinances or laws and shows the arrangement, layout, and design of the proposed use of a single parcel of land as shown in said plan. So in other words, uh, because we all go running around stating New York State laws, a site plan illustrates how a developer or developers intend to use a parcel, what uses and activities will occur on the site, and how those uses and activities relate to the existing landscape. So again, site plan review is really focused on one project. Where does it occur? Well, um, it occurs on a single piece of property or what's known as a common plan of development. Some of you have, may have heard this term through the New York State DEC, especially when it comes to stormwater regulations. But really what a common plan of development means, if you have one, um, one plan, maybe with multiple parcels or multiple phases, that's considered a common plan of development. So you're taking into account all of the pieces. And I have an example here on the next slide. So here on the left, we have a single parcel. Um, so it's one parcel with one proposed project. On the right, you have one larger common plan of development with multiple parcels. But as a reviewing board, you have to take everything into account. Even though it may be uh, developed in multiple phases, you're gonna look at everything as a total package. So again, it could be a single parcel or multiple parcels being developed together. Um, so if you have residential, commercial uses, uh, open space all together, you're gonna take everything into account. And this is very common um, with uh, planned unit developments and some of you may be undertaking reviews of those. So next let's ask the question, so why as a board member, why are we reviewing them? Well, site plan review procedures are really grounded in your zoning core or ordinance. Um, and in some rare cases for communities that don't have zoning, uh, site plan review procedures have been adopted independently um, as a separate local law by the governing board. When we start to talk about what uses are subject to site plan review, um, each code is different. Um, but each code will specify what uses within each zoning district are permitted and subject to site plan review. So in your code, you'll probably have one of two layouts. You'll have what I'm showing here um, on this slide. You'll have a list 
of different uses. Um, and then by district, it shows what's permitted and what's not. And then in a separate chapter, they'll have site plan uh, regulations that say what is and what isn't subject. Another um, code format you'll often see is a district will list um, kind of bullet point what is allowed, what's not, and what's subject to site plan review. So there's a lot of different versions. Um, again, each code is different. Unfortunately, we don't have one standard code here uh, in New York State, one standard format. Um, but I really encourage you to look at your codes very closely and start to understand what is permitted and then what is subject to site plan review. So now, um, let's look at what triggers a site plan review. Um, so there's, these are just a couple of the common reasons, the ones that you'll see the most. Um, so number one is when a business or industry plans on developing a new facility. So this can be on a vacant site, it can be a vacant um, a brownfield site, greenfield site, um, a building was torn down at one time and now it's just a kind of a greenfield site. Um, anything that is new um, in the commercial or the in, um, industrial realm are likely to be subject to site plan review. Uh, if you have an existing business um, or industry that is planning an addition or an expansion, um, they'll likely be subject to site plan review. Or if you're having um, one use converted to another. Um, so for example, and we use the example here, a residential use that converts, so you, if you have a, a single family or two family, and then they're building on and now it becomes a multifamily, that is likely to trigger site plan review. They can be large proposals and they can be small proposals. Um, again, your code will dictate that, but typically they're related to commercial, industrial, office, mixed use, multi-residential, and planned unit developments. So again, either triggered by a new use, change in use, or um, exceeding a threshold um, for an expansion of use. So here's a couple pictures of some of those uses um, that would, would trigger site plan review. Here you have in the upper left corner um, a smaller mixed use building that has potentially some offices or residential on the up, upper floors and potentially um, office or maybe a retail or dining uh, use on the first floor. We have in the middle top, we have an industrial use. Um, most industrial uses will be subject to site plan review. Um, whether it's a light or heavy industrial, some codes do differentiate. Um, others just say if it's an industrial use, it's subject to site plan review. Um, on the upper right, we have a multifamily. Um, and a multifamily is typically, again, subject. And then on the bottom, um, we have some commercial development and some other mixed use. And again, these are just a couple of examples, um, but your code will dictate what exactly um, will be subject. So now let's go on and look at, well, how do I know what is required by an applicant? I know they need to go through site plan review, but now what exactly do they have to do? So your code will outline the following. Um, as we just discussed, it will outline the uses that require site plan approval. It will also uh, tell you what review board is responsible. Some municipalities, it's their zoning board of appeals. In other municipalities, it's your planning board. Some municipalities don't have zoning boards and therefore planning boards have to do reviews of everything. Again, it's all dependent, but it's typically going to either be a ZBA or a planning board and maybe some rare instances um, you have a governing board. Um, but I, I don't even think I've, I've seen that. Um, your code is also going to outline um, your enforcement of conditions. So if you place conditions on your site plan, who is actually going to enforce it? Is it just your code enforcement? Is it uh, the uh, governing board? Um, and that'll be outlined uh, 
in your code. It's also going to have a list of submission requirements. Um, so everything that the applicant needs to submit with their application, it's going to list local procedures. So uh, what steps the applicant is going to have to go through, as well as all of the elements and components um, of criteria for review. So all of those nitty gritty details that you all are responsible for will be outlined in the code. If it's not in the code, it is not required. So this is just kind of a brief overview now of, of um, looking at kind of the, the big context of, of why we're undertaking site plan review um, and uh, kind of the, the steps to get there, what's required. Um, again, I would encourage every single one of you, um, if you haven't already, start to look at your code and really understand the procedures outlined in it. Um, and some of you may discover it might be time for a new updated code <laughs> as well. Um, so now we're going to move briefly into looking at uh, components of the application. This is really important because your application um, is really sets the tone. If your application is incomplete, missing pieces, um, and it comes to you before it ever really should, it just can set a really bad precedent for everything that's to come. You want strong applications coming to you. You want um, complete applications coming before your board. And so we're gonna take a few minutes here and talk about um, some of the steps and some of the um, uh, ways you can start to streamline the application process. Again, this all starts, um, your application sets the tone from the start, let's make it strong. So this doesn't really look as much at timelines and procedures, um, but more of items that you need to make sure you're checking off um, at your, your municipal level. So number one, your code is either going to be a three-step process or a two-step process. And in some instances, a four-step process. So what you're looking at in the screen right now is a four-step process that includes a pre-submission meeting, your application submission, preliminary site plan review, and final site plan review. Now note that pre-submission meetings and conferences are not mandatory in New York State. Highly recommended, which we're gonna talk about in another moment, um, but again, not mandatory. Um, so this is kind of a four or a three-step process, depending on how you, if you wanna include the pre-submission meeting. Um, but for argument's sake, right now we'll say it's a three-step. You have your application submission, your preliminary site plan, and then your final site plan. Now, some communities do this a little bit different, where they have just an application submission and then a final site plan. So they kind of skip that preliminary sketch plan phase, um, which is, I find to be very, very important and, and a critical component. Um, Again, some, some communities choose not to do it, but again, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail here in a moment. So this pre-submission meeting, I like to call out, um, I think it's extremely important, and if you don't have it in your code, I would encourage you to go to your, um, your elected officials and say, we need to make some changes to our code. We need to require pre-submission meetings and conferences, especially for larger projects. So what is a pre-submission meeting and conference? Well, um, the purpose of this um, really is to give both the municipality and the applicant an opportunity to gain really a better perspective um, on the proposal. So the pre-submission meeting would occur prior to the application. This is when the developer knows that they want to come to your community, they have a project in mind, and they're ready to talk about it, they're ready to get the process underway, they bought the land, they've secured the land, they have their finances secured, they're ready to go. Um, but again, it's not really a good idea for them to just come steamrolling in. There needs to be a lot of conversation beforehand. 
So a pre-submission meeting would consist of the project applicant, either a developer or often their representative. It would include your elected official. I would encourage um, either the supervisor or the mayor, um, if you're in a village or town, um, or even um, one of your trustees or town board members, just somebody, an elected official who can, can, can represent the board. You also need to have your code enforcement officer there, um, as well as your, the chair of your planning board and your zoning board. And this is important, especially if the project requires, um, for example, a variance, either a use or an area variance, and that they'll need approvals from multiple boards. You want everyone on the same page prior to an application ever even being submitted. And this may only be relevant for larger projects, um, larger projects um, that may have more uh, significant impacts. Um, but again, your, your code may, may define, um, it could be required for every application, that may be a lot to handle, or maybe just for those that exceed a certain threshold. So at this meeting, it's really important that your developers are provided with all relevant documentation that's going to be um, associated with the project, such as your comprehensive plan, your design guidelines or design standards, if you have them, applications, um, as well as a list of the procedures. How are we gonna get through this? What does a typical timeline look like? Provide them with all this material ahead of time so that six months down the road when you're going through a very intensive process, they don't turn around and say, well, I didn't know that. Give them everything up front so that, again, the process is really crystal clear. It's beneficial to both parties because really the community, um, especially the, the leaders, everyone that needs to make some decisions will gain knowledge of the developer's intent and the developer will learn his responsibilities before either um, before they're committed or they um, uh, spend a significant amount of time and money um, down the road just to get a denial. We don't want that. Um, so this really can be a, a um, trust building um, activity. And again, here's just an overview, again, uh, how it's just very beneficial uh, to, both, to both parties um, and a really important communication tool. Um, saves time and money and, and builds trust. Again, this is not mandatory, um, but I find very, very useful in the process. So one other item that is not mandatory at uh, the state level, but I would highly encourage, and this isn't anything that even needs to be written into the code, um, but a pre-submission presentation. So I have developers ask me all the time, they say, Jane, how does the community feel about this? Do, are they gonna like this? And my answer is, I don't know. Um, because I'm not the community. I'm one person representing the community. Um, and I said, maybe you need to go and talk to them yourself and get the feel because this is ultimately your project. So what I would do is I would encourage developers or applicants to present their preliminary ideas to the community prior to application. Um, this would help them get a feel for the community and what they're looking for and address any concerns upfront Again, it'll only help them save time and money and set a level of expectation. Now, um, another idea might be is to encourage uh, the, uh, your developer or project applicant um, to hold a small interest group or meet with an interest group, especially um, if you have, for example, environmental concerns um, and there's a very, or a very active local group, um, have them meet with them beforehand. Again, this helps set a level of expectation and it's a very, very important trust building um, activity that can really go a long way and really can help you get the type of development you want to see in the end. So this is uh, just the pre-application meeting. Again, I cannot stress how important it is um, if you don't already have it written into, into your procedures. So now let's take a look at the application submission. Um, so this is outlined in your code. 
um, but typically includes an application form. Um, it includes a sketch or preliminary site plan, or if you have the one phase review, it would be your final site plan, as well as a narrative. Um, some codes require or some procedures require the applicants to submit a short narrative demonstrating compliance with local plans, uh, your local comprehensive plan or your other long range plan um, if you have one or if it's required, excuse me. Um, remember, <laughs> there's nothing that probably irritates you more than seeing the application for the first time when you get to your board meeting. Um, applications should be distributed to all board members with ample time for you to prepare, for you to go and visit the site, to talk to your code enforcement officer, um, to ask questions to your attorney. Um, a really great rule of thumb um, that I like to encourage, and, and again, your codes might have different timelines, but two weeks. Um, have the applications available two weeks prior to the board meeting that you're going to be reviewing. Um, it should be submitted um, to the municipality first, probably to your buildings um, or to your code enforcement officer. Uh, give them one week to review it and to deem it complete followed by one week for you as board members uh, to review and prepare. Um, again, you want to be able to go into your first meeting um, and to be able to get, just hit the ground running. Um, getting it the night before um, usually doesn't, doesn't give you enough time to really think and process the application. So with the application, um, you're going to have now um, a, again, if uh, either a preliminary or a final site plan. So in your code, it says that the applicant submits a sketch or preliminary site plan. What does this mean? What does this look like? This is not it. Um, submitting a sketch on the back of a napkin or a ripped out piece of paper from a notebook, it has happened, I think I've seen it all. This does not constitute a sketch plan. Rather, a sketch plan is a um, basic layout of the site, um, typically uh, drawn up or marked up um, as a CAD document um, that shows uh, your location um, and dimensions of the buildings, uh, proposed parking, ingress, egress, all your landscaping and buffers. Um, and it really shows the site in context. Again, this is preliminary, it's not going to have everything. Um, but what's included, um, uh, again, this is usually prepared by a licensed architect or engineer, um, especially for those new developments and or expansion uh, of, a, of a building or a use. For smaller projects, so say you have someone who's just simply adding 10 parking spaces um, within their parking lot or maybe a 200 square foot addition, but yet they're still subject to site plan review. Um, sometimes just a Google Earth sketch uh, where you pull up Google Earth and you can draw in those parking spaces and get them pretty much scaled, that may be sufficient as well. Again, this is more towards those larger developments. And some codes do outline major and minor uh, site plan and thus the, the requirements may be a little different. For your final site plan, um, you're gonna have a detailed set of, of um, plans. And what that means is you'll have a survey, a location map that shows existing conditions, as well as your proposed uh, buildings and layout with relation to roads, access, utilities, all your stormwater management. Um, and these will be typically stamped by a licensed engineer or architect. Additional plan sheets uh, will include um, all of your details and your specifications such as your signage and lighting details, all your pedestrian layouts, parking, and whatnot. Um, and again, remember, if you have a one phase uh, uh, site plan process, um, and especially for a larger development, this is what would be submitted to you um, one time, and then you'd go through the process from there. So this is a quick example of a plan sheet. Um, again, it shows all the detail. You can see on the right here, this is what 
the plantings look like, um, a, a detailed landscape planting plan would look like. Um, and again, this is everything that would be used um, to obtain your building permits and be given to the, the contractors for construction. Here's an example of what an elevation is. And elevations are fantastic because, especially if you don't have a, a ton of experience reading plans, it can be hard to sometimes visualize what the project's going to look like. So if you request elevations, this is what you would receive. And you can see it shows kind of, um, you'll get a, a detail of each side of the proposed building um, and what it would look like as well as what the different materials are. So you can get a much better sense of, of what it is, it is overall going to look like. So once you jump um, into your final plan and you're ready to start to act on approvals, remember a couple of items. You have to be compliant with Seeker um, and this will help determine if, there's, if the project is going to have any adverse environmental impacts. Um, you're going to determine if you're going to hold a public hearing um, and that is entirely up to the board. I always recommend it, especially on your larger projects. Um, you want to give the chance, uh, the public a chance to have some input on it. Um, remember to refer your project to the county and any neighboring municipalities within 500 feet from your property line. And this is per uh, general municipal law 239 section um, LM and N. And then you're going to want to refer your project to other regional and state agencies. Um, this, as we have on the screen here, New York State DOT, DEC, um, as well as your local um, fire and police services, especially <laughs> fire and police. They're going to want to make sure that they have proper access to the site. Before you approve a final site plan, remember, as a board, you have the ability to place conditions on the site plan as long as they directly relate to the site itself. And common examples that I, I listed here, one is with lighting. Um, so for example, um, if you have lights on a, a gas station and the gas station closes at midnight, you can put a condition that the lights um, where the gas pumps are have to dim or turn off at a certain hour. Maybe it's right next to a residential community or um, another maybe more lighter use. So you can put conditions on the timing of the lights. Or landscaping. This one is more common than I think any of them. Um, if you have a proposed commercial use that's adjacent to maybe a school or next to a residential area, you can place um, enhanced conditions uh, to make sure that there's a stronger buffer between these two uses. Likewise, you as board members also have the ability to waive requirements um, if you see that it's unnecessary um, and it is in the interest of the public health and welfare. So this happens a lot with your smaller site plan reviews. Um, so I always like to use the example of a, a smaller project. You have a, a restaurant owner that wants to add 10 spaces onto uh, their, um, the back parking lot of their restaurant or bar. And instead of having them go through an extensive long list for site plan uh, review, you decide that you're going to waive a certain requirement, such as the lighting they don't need to do additional lighting, maybe for 10 spaces. Um, or you find that there's something else that just doesn't make much sense in this case. Um, you have the ability to request a waiver and you can get authorization from your governing board. Um, I encourage you to be very careful with waivers. Again, you're setting a precedent and if you do it for one project, uh, will it come back again? So just be very careful when you're looking for waivers, um, but be mindful that it, again, it can place a stress or a burden um, if you make them go through certain things that maybe just aren't required. Again, this might apply maybe to your, to your more smaller uh, projects. So now we've kind of wrapped up what your uh, uh, applications look like, um, what a preliminary site plan includes, and what happens with your final site plan. So now we're gonna jump into what I think is the funnest part of, of this presentation. 
Um, while I wish this was a little bit more interactive, um, I like to show rather than state um, how the decision making process kind of goes. So I like to kick off with um, what I hear most often from board members. So you'll see on this next slide here, the yes board and the no board. Um, so the yes board, while we can't tell them what to do, it's our only option is to approve the site plan. Or we need the development, our community is suffering, we need economic development, we have to say yes. And I hear from one board member, well, my board says yes to everything. So why am I even bothering? On the contrary, you have the no boards where people, the board members are, you know, this plan doesn't match in color, it doesn't follow anything, our only option is to deny it, and it's done. Or we don't need another fill in the blank, our community is overrun by them. Or uh, my board says just, no to everything so why am i even bothering and i'm sure all of you have heard this at one time or another but the reality is every project that comes before you as a board member um, or a code enforcement officer you must a follow the same procedures and protocol with each applicant everyone needs to be treated exactly the same um, again, you're setting a tone and you never want to be accused of, of playing favoritism to one project or another. That could end in disaster. You need a tran transparent process. And what I mean by this is that all your decision making happens in an open forum, not behind closed doors. So, for example, all board members are meeting um, uh, open meeting laws. You do not discuss them amongst yourself. You do not call each other to just kind of say, well, what are you gonna do and what am I gonna do? No, everything needs to be discussed in an open forum. Your decision-making process needs to be grounded in the code. And I reference this and you've heard me reference this now over and over. Um, that is, you can only review and comment on those components that are specified in your review process. You cannot make it up. You cannot add to the list. You can only go by what's outlined in your code. Again, and this goes back to number one, following the same procedures and protocol with each applicant. Um, and last but not least, projects are compliant with your municipally adopted comprehensive master plan, design guidelines and design standards, if you have them, um, or other adoptive long range planning document. Um, and this is where all of you might be thinking, I should probably go and see when the last time that was written. But if you have it, if you have a comprehensive plan in New York State, you need to be compliant with it. If you don't have it, that's another long conversation we don't, we don't want to get into right now. But just know that your projects do need to be compliant with it. So next. Um, this is a, a quote I get all the times. So I'm just a volunteer board member. I want to give back to my community. How do I know what's good or bad development? Um, I always like to say that people are the best judge and that you know what good development looks like from bad. We all know what we want to see and what we don't and what the community will typically like. Um, a lot of this is common sense. And if you're following the rules in place that we just spoke about, and you have a board that's willing to enforce it, then this should be a win-win all around. Um, when in doubt, call your experts. Um, you have the authority as planning and zoning board members to utilize professional engineers, architects, planners, geologists, licensed uh, in any of these fields, any expert to help make your decision. Remember, this is a cost to the applicant, not to the municipality. Um, I would always recommend at a minimum that uh, you utilize your professional uh, engineers, um, particularly on large scale development projects. They'll really help you inform the process as well as provide important technical uh, aspects that you may not have on the board. Um, 
some expertise that you, you just simply may not have as volunteer uh, board members. But we're going to take now a little bit of a closer look at some of those review elements that you will be responsible for and um, some of the associated best practices. So more times than not, you will be reviewing building layouts, traffic, parking, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, noise, signage, and architectural detail. You may have additional requirements, um, but again, these are kind of the standard that are typically outlined in a code. So one of the first things that you're going to look at with a site plan review is the building layout and the placement on the site, how it relates to everything else around it. Um, and so what you really want to start to look for is encouraging pedestrian activity, um, especially what we call the human scale. That is um, placing your buildings um, a little bit more closer to the street. Um, again, giving more emphasis on the human and the visual interest um, versus cars and the vehicle priority. So that is, again, orienting your building closer to the street with your parking in back or on the rear. And again, making your uh, pedestrian the priority, not the vehicle. And these are some of the examples you'll see. I sometimes have a tendency to use Walgreens and Rite Aids. Um, I don't own stock in them. Um, but again, there's, there's some really great examples out there to demonstrate what we're talking about. So looking at your building layout and where it is, encouraging developers to put it closer to the street to start to build that better streetscape is always going to be one of the first things that you're going to start to look at. Another one that is always at the top of the list is traffic. How much traffic is this project uh, going to generate? Um, things you want to consider, limiting your curb cuts. We all know that when we're going 30, 35 miles an hour down a road and all of a sudden the car breaks to turn in and then another one breaks to turn in, um, it can be a serious safety issue. So you want projects to limit curb cuts look at uh, shared driveways and shared access points, again, just to increase pedestrian safety. Other things you'll want to look at are site distance, how the intersections are going to operate, and then how um, uh, ingress and egress, how cars are going to actually come in and out, as well as trucks and garbage trucks and all those other users of the site. If you have urgent care facilities, you're gonna to wanna to look at potentially how ambulances are gonna come in and out of the site. So traffic and access management is a, is a really big deal in most projects. And if you need assistance, especially when it comes to analyzing traffic, I would highly encourage you to um, uh, contact a transportation engineer who could help walk you through the decision making. Um, but again, these are just some of the big ideas that you'll want to consider. You'll also want to consider cues. Um, so I like to use the example of a drive through because we, I'm pretty sure we've all seen these in, in one way or another come before a board. Um, and this is always, always raises um, questions with traffic and site accessibility. So um, I want you to start to think about cues, especially are they backing up into the road? Are they not? Um, do you still maintain a strong streetscape? Um, are your cars going through along, when they come out, are they going in front of the building and along your main street? Is that what the pedestrian's looking at? And this is actually a really great example I found here where um, it looks like it's a coffee shop um, and drive through, but it uses a side road access to come in um, and exit on that same side road, maintaining a strong street frontage um, where pedestrians can walk in right off of the sidewalk, there's an outdoor seating area, and they maintain um, the building close to the street. So that's what you're gonna wanna look through, especially when it comes to, to drive-throughs, um, how much of that drive-through is taking up your street frontage, and is it distracting um, to the pedestrian? So next, another one that comes up all the time. This is one of the most talked about items in site plan review, and I'm pretty sure we could do an entire presentation on parking alone. 
Um, but here we're just going to touch briefly on parking, internal circulation, and waste management. Um, we've all seen pictures like this where many developers design to the maximum um, one maximum you stay a year and that's either black friday or the holiday rush and this is becoming absolutely antiquated um, many communities are now stepping back and requiring um, parking maximums as opposed to minimums and a lot of developers are really happy about this um, where they used to require 1500 parking spaces it now requires 600. Um, so now um developers it's up to them to make a case for why they have to exceed that's if you use a parking maximum um and many communities still use parking minimums um and it's it's nice because it can help save money as well for a developer in the long in the long run but let's take a look at at some parking here um i always encourage you to limit parking in the front of the building again this all comes back to building placement um, and you can see here um, the difference again uh, to Walgreens examples that are fantastic um, the one on the left has the parking all around the building um, and doesn't maintain a strong street frontage whereas the one on the right the parking um, would be on the rear or to the side and again it allows pedestrians to easily access the site Something else I want you to start to think about is how are your pedestrians getting safely from point A to point B? Um, have you considered ADA accessibility? People, users of all ages and abilities. Um, so your example here on the left is a, a larger parking lot um, in a standard kind of um, development that has multiple big box stores and chains and restaurants. Um, but the site actually has beautiful lighting, um, really great lighting and vegetation. However, if you um, have any type of, of challenge and you need to be closer, um, how do you get there without getting run over? Um, and so I like the picture on the right. Um, good design will incorporate pedestrian safety and accessibility um, in any size parking lot. This is critical. Again, you may be um, driving to the site, um, but you're really allowing um, and emphasizing the pedestrian once they get there. One other item that is sometimes overlooked um, is the consideration for uh, waste receptacles. So especially uh, your dumpsters, um, you don't wanna put them right where people are parking, outdoor eating, uh, outdoor dining. Um, so you're gonna wanna consider how these are on the, um, placed on the site, but also um, noise that's generated from trucks. How are the um, trucks getting in and out of the site to pick them up? Um, as well as looking at your options to conceal and to enclose. Um, there's some really great designs out there. I have a couple photos here um, on the right. Um, and this will help, especially um, with little critters and creatures that want to get into them at night. Um, it could pose a health, uh, health safety issues. So you're going to want to make sure that your applicants um, have a really strong plan for how they're going to deal with waste management. Next, as we start to wrap up here, um, is landscaping. Um, and landscaping really takes the form of, of two areas. One is in your parking lot, and another is on your streetscape. And within the parking lots, um, I, this is absolutely one of my favorite photos because this, this small tree here that I circled in red that serves absolutely no purpose. Um, what I like to say is purpose, purposeful landscaping. What purpose is it intending to serve? Um, how does it fit in um, with, with the rest of, of the area? Um, if you're going for shade, you're going to want to select, have your developer select trees that are going to be a little bit faster growing. You're gonna to wanna to take into consideration where the sun moves and where shade is. Is it actually shading the lawn and not the car at high noon? Um, but again, it should have a purpose. Um, you're gonna to want to encourage creative and interesting site design as well as potentially incorporating green infrastructure for stormwater management. 
Um, and here's a couple of really great examples of how to incorporate them into your parking areas. Kind of moving along with that is streetscape design and uh, developing, again, purposeful landscaping. Um, it's great to just want to plant trees, um, but how are they ultimately going to look? How does it tie into the rest of the streetscape? Is there already a defined pattern along the street that you want to continue? And also, very, very important is, can it be maintained and who's going to maintain it? Which we'll talk about again in, in a moment here as we start to wrap up. The next thing you'll want to consider is stormwater management. And this is where you're going to absolutely want to get your engineer on board early. Stormwater management is becoming a very, if not already, a very, very important issue in site design. Um, as you've seen recently in the news, we are experiencing significant amount of flooding um, all over. And especially in areas where you didn't have flooding before, we are experiencing now um, standing water is a huge issue. And so incorporating um, good practices for stormwater management, green infrastructure where you can, will help minimize the impacts from localized flooding um, and is an important safety issue. So get, um, get your applicants to address stormwater early in the process. Um, and try to incorporate it into the design. It shouldn't be a burden. You can, as you can see here on the right, you can make stormwater work um, through rain gardens um, and other impervious surfaces. It can start to make the site even better and enhance it. It's not supposed to, to make it into something that's a burden. So moving on from stormwater management is lighting. Lighting is also um, an issue, especially when it comes to property lines. And so this is a really great diagram here of um, some good and bad lighting. Um, most places now start to look at dark sky compliance fixtures. And so these are fixtures that are pointed downward. Um, uh, some are encouraging uh, LED lighting for energy saving and longer life. Um, but your lighting is something you're going to want to take a very close look at. Um, and again, if you don't have dark sky uh, compliance regulations in your code, you'll want to make some amendments to include them and make them a requirement now of, of developers to reduce noise or excuse me, light pollution. Moving on to noise, and I I'm, apologize if I'm going too fast. I know we have only have a few minutes left. We just have a couple of slides here. Um, this one always makes me laugh um, because, well, this is what we thought we were getting as a vegetative buffer to reduce noise, um, but this is what we got. So your developer says they're going to plant a beautiful hedgerow with a variety of trees, and that's great. Just remember, though, uh, trees take a long time to establish in a new environment. Think about snow, ice, salt upstate New York weather, and what type of vegetation will survive busy parking lots and streets. Um, it takes a long time for a tree to grow uh, 20 feet. Um, and so consider what the landscape is going to look like during this time and encourage uh, the use of a variety of plants, trees, uh, structures such as fences and, and nice walls to help minimize immediate impacts to the neighbors. Also consider noise from with regards to trucks, uh, drive throughs ambulances, trash collections. How do all these noises affect um, th your neighbors? And do the best to minimize. Next is signage. Um, and I'll just speak really briefly to this. Be careful not to over-regulate signs. Um, I've worked with communities who have tried to regulate logos, colors, um, and this is borderline <clears throat> First Amendment rights. So, if you're in a historic uh, district that has specific rules and regulations um, on colors and size and logos, that's one thing. But if you're looking at just standard development outside of a historic district, um, you have to adhere strictly to what is in your code. Um, and again, you have to be very, very careful. Um, but encourage uh, signs um, and nice signs, um, perhaps updating your codes to include examples of what you do want to see. Again, the more information you can provide the developer, the better. And last but not least, uh, 
architectural detail. Um, you're going to have a list of what you're looking for in your code. Um, review what they what is required. Um, if you have design guidelines, um, again, provide them to the applicant early in the process. Um, let them know exactly what you're looking for. If you have design standards, that gives you even more teeth in the process. Um, I would encourage all of you to, to adopt them at the local level. Um, remember, you cannot mandate um, every single detail when it comes to architecture. Um, it has to be within reason. This I, I like because it shows three um, different images of the same uh, chain. So we have a family dollar here and a Panera. Um, Panera most of them are actually beautiful buildings. It was very difficult to find, but I couldn't do any more Walgreens examples. And here you have probably what would not be considered acceptable development on the left. In the middle, it's better. And then on the right is fantastic. Um, and this goes into kind of my next point of, okay, Jane, this all looks great, but the developer insists that they have to use this layout to make it work. This is the building. This is, this is what they have to have. How do I go against this? Well, when it comes to a, a lot of chain uh, uh, stores and establishments and restaurants, um, this actually comes down to the franchise. Um, they have a very, uh, franchisees have a very small design fee. And what they do is they take a kind of set of plans and they adapt it to the site. Um, so, it's more when it comes down to it, it comes down to the financing. Um, but here's how you start to work with it and you get this type of design on the right. One, set your expectations early in the process, again, by doing a pre-application meeting or conference. Stay true to your code and be willing to enforce it. Leverage the seeker process um, to help determine any in adverse impacts. Um, understand and enforce your comprehensive plan and design guidelines, consult your regional agencies and design experts, and last but not least, enforcement is key. Um, once your developer pulls a building permit, um, your applicant bills, uh, pulls the building permit, the project is just beginning. Your code's office, and as code enforcement officers, you need to make sure you understand what approvals took place in those meetings, what conditions were placed, if any, and you need to stay on top of the process from start to finish. Um, as a condition, and this is really great, um, you may require that all approved conditions associated with development um, must be met to the extent practical, practicable, excuse me, prior to your final CO or certificate of compliance. And so, conditions really can help ensure that everything they said they were going to do is actually done. So with that being said, I know that was a lot of information um, and I, I will um, uh, turn it over to Sarah and ask if there's, there's any questions. I know this was a lot of information and I talked fast, um, but I'd be happy to answer any. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the question and answer box at the moment. Um, okay. And here I can go on to, I can go on to, here is my contact information. Um, yeah, I know, again, this is a lot of information and the site plan review process can certainly go in 45 different directions. Um, but again, I, I just wanted you all to be able to see really some of the key items that you need to be looking for when you start to review these projects. Um, you do have, uh, have control over the process and um, work with your applicants and that's how you will really get the results that you want. Thank you very much, Jane, for presenting for us today, appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I hope next time we can be in person. Um, <laughs> feels a little strange. I feel like I'm talking to myself, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to distribute the presentation for the website and then you can go back and review 
on your own. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye.